Again, we want to welcome you to this, our first night in the study of the Apocrypha, or what are sometimes referred to as the lost books of the Bible. Um, any of you love a really good conspiracy story? Because this is actually a true one. How about the fact that the Bible that you have today, unless, unless you were raised Catholic, is not the same as the Bible we originally had as Christians? I'm not making that up. That's true. This is true in two ways. First of all, the text of your Old Testament, the actual words, are not the words that Christians were using in the first, second, third, and fourth centuries. So there was a change. Second, our Old Testament today no longer contains all of the books that were in every Christian Bible in the world until the year 1699, or about 1700 years. Until fairly recently, there were seven additional books in the Old Testament, and two of the other books, Daniel and Esther, had extra material. Daniel had two extra chapters. Esther was twice as long, still is in the Catholic Bible. In the early church, they had even more books. They had 14 additional books in their Old Testament at least. And there may be an argument that there was actually more than that. Today, we refer most commonly to these lost books as the Apocrypha. The word Apocrypha means hidden or secret. And the term Apocrypha, at least in the Protestant world, kind of implies that these books are not genuine, that they're not accepted as Scripture, and therefore they have no value. That's sort of the, the deal that's out there. Now, it's helpful to keep in mind as we start this 10-week journey together that the Apocrypha is an exclusive Protestant term. Catholics will never use that term. Orthodox will never use that term. Most Christians in the world do not use the term Apocrypha. That's strictly a Protestant term. For over 1.2 billion Catholics, these books have a different name. They're referred to as Deutero canonical, or second canon. For the 300 million Orthodox Christians, there simply is no distinction whatsoever. It's simply scripture. The books are just woven in. Historically, the books that we have that we call the Apocrypha, and books that are excluded from most of our Bibles today, unless we explicitly buy a Bible with the Apocrypha, these books were in every Christian Bible until the year 1699. We'll be near the end of the presentation tonight. We'll, we'll talk about that particular day. So tonight, what we want to do is to begin our study of the Apocrypha by exploring the story. What is the Apocrypha? How did it become Scripture? And how did it cease to be Scripture among Protestants? And then for the next nine weeks, we're just going to be looking at it. So I want to sort of map out what we're going to do. Here's the order. Next week, we're just going to take 1 Maccabees, which is a history book of the period roughly in the 2nd century B.C., the period that's sort of leading up to the time of Jesus, and the period that tells us, for example, where did the Pharisees come from, where did the Sadducees come from, and things like that. The next week, we're going to do 2nd Maccabees, also covering the same period, but an entirely different approach. Then, third week, we'll do Richard's favorite book, The Wisdom of Ben Sirach, or Sirach. The week after that, we'll do The Wisdom of Solomon. The week after that, we'll do the stories, kind of like short stories, that, kind of like you'd see in the, the book of Jonah or the book of uh, Esther, but, but it's Tobit and Judith. They're not in our Bible. Then we're going to deal with additions to existing books. So what about this longer version of Esther? What about the extra chapters to Daniel? And what about five extra Psalms? Psalm 151 to Psalm 155. Then we'll deal with a type of literature known as rewritten history. It's basically telling, taking a story that's in the Bible and giving it a twist. One is called Baruch. Baruch was the scribe of Jeremiah. The other one is called the prayer of Manasseh. Manasseh was infamously the most evil king that ever existed. But in the prayer of Manasseh, he gets a rewrite. 
Then we have two books called First and Second Esdras. Second Esdras is also called Fourth Ezra. Jewish tradition calls it Fourth Ezra. Christian tradition calls it Second Esdras. And then we're going to look at two uh, some books that are in the uh, the Orthodox Bible, not the Catholic. Third and Fourth Maccabees. That's the plan. Tonight, the story of the Apocrypha. It begins with the Jews and the Jewish Bible. Originally, we know that the Jews were neural culture. One of the ways we know this is that Paleo-Hebrew or ancient Hebrew, there is no word for read, for write, or for author. We've never found those words in ancient Hebrew, which means even when they were writing, they didn't have a term for it. What's that, what that tells us is, is that originally, way back, the Jewish people, like a lot of others, were oral culture. Their faith was based on the temple and on sacrifice. It was not based on a written text. They would not do what Jews would do today in a synagogue. You would never see that. There was no scripture. There was no preaching of sermons, nothing like that. You went to the temple, you brought your sacrifice, and you sacrificed at the temple. But as a result of the destruction of Jerusalem, the temple, by the Babylonians, and then the Jews going into the Babylonian exile, 596, 587, the Jews lost everything. They lost their, their freedom, their land, their nation, their king, their temple, their priests, their way of worshiping. So they're now in a foreign land. You may remember Psalm 137, by the waters of Babylon, there we lay down and wept for our captors required of us songs of Zion. How can we sing songs of Zion in a foreign land? So it's a faith crisis. If you can't worship with anything you've ever used, how do you worship? So it's in this period, scholars believe, that we, we, we begin to see the Jewish people taking their traditions, codifying them, writing them down, putting them together, and beginning to use them as what we would today call scripture. So out of this period comes the synagogue. Out of this period will come scriptures. And out of this period will become a new way of worshiping God, which is basically to read and to preach on a text. It's during the Persian period that followed. The Persians conquered Babylon, roughly 538, 540. The Jews are freed. They're allowed to go home. As Richard mentioned, for about two centuries, the 500s and the 400s, down to about 331, the Jews are under Persian occupation, but they're doing very, very well. They were treated well. We next move to the Greek period. The story of this, how this happens then begins with one of the greatest figures of the ancient world, Alexander the Great. This is a very fun, famous mosaic of him from the time. By 450 B.C., even before Alexander, when the Old Testament closes, the Jews had returned from exile and they rebuilt the temple. They now have some new things. They've got sacred writings. They're using them for a new way to worship God. Book of Nehemiah chapter 8 talks about that, where the book of the, the Ezra the prophet takes the scroll of the law, he opens it, he reads it, uh, from morning to night, and then Le Levites then give sense to the text, the first sermon. It's after this period, when the Jews have returned with Ezra and Nehemiah in that period, that we begin to find our earliest references in some writings to things called scriptures. That just means writings. But they'd also refer to sacred writings. Not a Bible, but certain writings are beginning to have the status of scripture. At first, this language is applied to the Torah, to the books of the law, the first five books. Later, during the time period that we're going to be studying, we can see it's being applied to the prophets. So, for example, 2 Maccabees, a book that we're going to look at in two weeks, has this little interesting statement in it. Judas, or Judah, who was the, one of the Maccabee sons, encouraged his troops from the law and the prophets. So in the Maccabean period, in the 160s BC, BCE, the law exists, the Torah, and the prophets, and they seem to be referring here to these are scriptures. The prophets aren't people, the prophets are writing, and they're being used as scripture. Finally, the language was then applied to other writings. So the prologue of the book of Sirach, Richard's favorite book, says this. 
many great teachings have been given to us through the law and the prophets and the other books of our ancestors that followed them. Now, those who read these scriptures, so the law, the prophets, and the other writings now have the status of scripture. You probably know the Jewish Bible today is, is divided into the law, the prophets, and the writings. This is probably at least 100 years before Jesus. 332 BCE, the Persian period comes to a crashing end as Alexander the Great sweeps across the Middle East. He doesn't stop till he gets into India. The Jews come under Greek rule, and this rule is going to last for two centuries. Alexander and the rulers who follow him impose Greek culture and language on those they ruled, but unevenly. Sometimes it's more strongly enforced. For example, for the first hundred years under the Ptolemies of Egypt, it's a very loose kind of reign. The Jews are pretty much allowed to live their own life. But this is something known as Hellenism, the desire to have Greek culture combined with the local culture. Now, during this period, as Richard mentioned, most Jews live outside of Palestine. This is called the diaspora. Richard mentioned 80%. You'll get estimates as high as 95%. But the point is, the vast majority of Jews did not live in Palestine. They lived scattered across the rest of the world. And of course, if you're anywhere else in this world, realistically, you're under Greek domination and Greek culture. As a result, the language for most Jews became Greek, except the ones in Palestine. Hebrew was primarily limited to Jerusalem. Most Jews living outside of Palestine neither spoke nor understood Hebrew. Greek is their language. Around 200 BCE, a momentous event happens. Actually, two momentous events. On the one hand, you've got the Seleucids take control of Palestine, away from the, the, the Egyptians or the Ptolemies. The other event happens actually in Alexandria, which Richard was talking about. The Jewish scriptures began, began to be translated into Greek in Alexandria. Most scholars believe that this did not happen all at once, that the Torah was first, then the prophets and the writings and other writings, but it, it took a while. But what this did is it enabled the vast majority of Jews who could not understand Hebrew to have access to their scriptures in the language they could understand, which of course would be crucially important. This Greek translation becomes known later as the Septu Septuagint from Septa, meaning 70. Uh, the abbreviation is sometimes in Roman numerals LXX, meaning Septuagint. Because of this, tra this tradition, uh, or this is because of the tradition that uh, from multiple sources said that 70 scholars had translated it, so the 70 name gets applied to it. Both the first century Jewish historian Josephus and the letter of Orestes, which was written in Alexandria, narrate the story of how the Septuagint came to be. I'm just going to share one with you. I'm going to share a little bit of the letter of Orestes. This is second century BC. Uh, the letter has the letter's long, there's a lot of things in it, but this is a little vignette in there about how did the how did the Septuagint come to be? The work of translation was completed in 72 days, just as if it had been arranged for a set purpose, like God's hand was on it. After the books had been read, the priests and the elders of the translators and the Jewish community and the leaders of the people, in other words, everyone buys in on this, said that since so excellent and sacred and accurate a translation had been made, it is only right that it should remain as it was and that no alteration should be made in it. You can see it's, it's become scripture. This was to ensure that the book might be preserved for all the future time and change. So this is the, the from the letter of Orestes, the, the story of how it came to be. According to the letter of Orestes, the Septuagint is held to be sacred. It is to be preserved for all time. It is to be unchanged with no alteration. In other words, for Jews outside Palestine, the Greek Septuagint has replaced 
the Hebrew as Holy Scripture. When we get a little bit later to Augustine, we're going to get another little uh, part of this. Philo of Alexandria, a very famous Jew, he's roughly a contemporary with the Apostle Paul, writing in the first century of the Common Era, confirms and elaborates in this tradition. He states that each of the 72 translators were shut into separate cells, and that miraculously, when they, they, they each translated the whole, the whole thing, when they come out, all 72 translations are compared, and voila, they are identical. In other words, it's a miracle, it's a God thing. Proving that the Septuagint had been directly inspired by God. That's what the writing says. Both Josephus and the Jewish Talmud also contain versions of this same story of the miraculous and the divine origin of the Septuagint. All of which is to say, this is, this is underwriting, that the Hebrew is not God's word for these people. The Greek is God's word. At the time this was done, no one had yet definitively determined what was or what was not scripture. The Torah, definitely. The prophets, probably. But beyond that, it was a little vague. Many texts not found in our Bible today, texts that we'll be looking at, were held to be sacred and inspired, and they were read as scripture. We know that from the Dead Sea Scrolls and from other sources, Josephus, uh, Philo, and others. Meanwhile, books continued to be produced that were considered sacred scripture. But the first century, by the first century, we know that there's over a hundred of these books, at least, that are out there. This is the book of Second Esdras. It's one of the books in the Apocrypha that we'll look at from chapter 14. Ninety-four books were written. Make public the 24 books and let the worthy and the unworthy read them. Just a note here, the, the, the 24 books is the same as the 39 books in our Bible. This is the Old Testament that we have. They just numbered them differently. The 12 minor prophets were considered one book, the book of the minor prophets. First and second Chronicles was one book. First and second Kings was one book. First and second Samuel was one book. Ezra and Nehemiah was one book. And you crunch the math and 39 becomes 24, but they're identical. It's our Old Testament. 94 books are written, but the ones we have, let the worthy and the unworthy read them, but keep the 70 70 books that are not in our Bible that were written last in order to give them to the wise among your people. So for this author, what's important is not the 39 that we have, it's the other 70. There where the real richness lies. For in them, he says, is the spring of understanding, the fountain of wisdom, and the river of knowledge. This is the extra 70 books. This is why no two ancient manuscripts of the Septuagint contain exactly the same books. <clears throat> so today when we talk about the books of the Septuagint, we're going to find that different versions of the Septuagint have slightly different books, and so we have to look at all of them to kind of put it together. Now, during this period, what we have, and this is important, we have Scripture. Scripture means that some books have value. They're, they're thought to be God's word, but we don't have a Bible, and the Bible is a set list of books, also called a canon, and the idea here is we don't yet have a list where somebody says, these and only these books are scripture and nothing else is scripture. All we've got is people using various writings as scripture. As a result, the Septuagint has a much larger number of books than will ultimately be in the Hebrew Bible. Again, no two copies are the same. We'll talk about that a little bit later. In the various versions of the Septuagint, we find all 39 books of our Old Testament, 24 in the Jewish numbering. By the way, these are consistent. They're in all of them. We find 12 additional books, and we have additions to two other books. It's these 12 and the additions to two we'll be talking about. Here's a list. I've color-coded it so you can see. The names in black are the books that you'll find not in the Protestant Bible, but in the Catholic Bible. First and Second Maccabees, the two books of wisdom, Tobit 
Judith, additions to Esther, additions to Daniel and Baruch. That's all the, the Catholic Bible that's extra. The Orthodox Bible has all of our books, all of the extra books in the Catholic Church, Church's Bible, and the books that are in red. First and Second Ezra, First and Fourth Maccabees, Psalm 151, Odes, and Psalm of Solomon. The Ethiopian Church in Africa has two others, Enoch and Jubilees. Enoch and Jubilees are not normally listed in the Apocrypha. They're, they're given a second category called the Pseudepigrapha or the false writings. I list them here because we're actually going to be looking at Enoch a little further and uh, because it's just kind of interesting to know that. Now, in Palestine, the Jews are using Hebrew and Aramaic texts. Everywhere else, the Jews are using the Greek translation, the Septuagint. The Greek Septuagint is the first collection of texts to function as a Bible. We don't officially have a Bible, but once you take a group of writings and you, you, you put them together, which is what the Septuagint is, even if it's not officially a Bible, it's functioning as a Bible. It's a set of texts. The Septuagint also preserves a text and this is that is much older than the Hebrew text we have today by at least four centuries. 400, actually probably much older than that. The, the, the Septuagint is locked in. It was translated from Hebrew to Greek, pretty much second century BC. It's only around the year 400 AD that the Jews are finalizing the Hebrew text, and it's not till the 900s AD that they add the vowel points and stuff. So the, the, the Old Testament text in Hebrew is really not finalized until the 10th century AD. The Septuagint is second century BC. Interestingly, the Dead Sea Scrolls in Hebrew are also second century BC. So we've got, we've got the Old Testament in two forms, second century BC and in one form, 10th century AD. That becomes important in translating our Old Testament. For the vast majority of Jews who live outside of Palestine, the Septuagint is their Bible. Now, why is that important? Well, the first Christians were Jews. And the early church, for probably well into the second century, were essentially Jews. They were essentially Jews for Jesus. That meant that the first Christians outside Palestine, Paul, all the New Testament writers and others, their scriptures are not the Hebrew scriptures. Their, their scriptures are the Septuagint. When the New Testament refers to the sacred scriptures, it is not referring just to the Old Testament. It is referring to the Septuagint. We know that because all of the quotations in the New Testament, all the quotations of the New Old Testament in the New Testament are from the Septuagint. Not a single one is from the Hebrew. This is what Paul, the gospel writers, and all the other New Testament writers are quoting. They're quoting the Greek Septuagint. Every single quote in the Old Testament of the Old Testament in the New from the Septuagint. In the second century, we used to say AD or CE, common era, following the two Jewish failed Jewish revolts and the destruction of the temple, and four centuries after the Septuagint was created, the rabbis in Palestine finally decide what books would and would not be scripture. And the reasoning is pretty profound. They lost the temple, and by the end of the second Jewish revolt in 117, it's pretty clear they're never getting the temple back. If you don't have a temple and you don't have sacrifice, you don't have a priesthood, what do you base your faith on? Well, what they've got is scripture, the synagogue, and the tradition of worship based on the reading and interpretation of God's law. Well, if you're going to do that, then it matters what is scripture. If you base your faith on scripture, what is scripture? The Protestants, we'll talk about that in a few minutes, have the same issue during the Protestant Reformation. In other words, what will become the basis of the new rabbinic Judaism? Because there's a lot of books out there. The rabbis sought to base Judaism on the more ancient, what they believed to be the purer form of the faith, 
the faith that they believe that existed prior to Greek and Roman influence, or they would say Greek and Roman corruption. Because a lot of new ideas had come in, Plato and reincarnation and all kinds of things. And the Jewish rabbis were basically arguing, that's, that's not part of our historic faith. The criteria for deciding, and we know this because their, their writings survive, which writings were considered to be sacred, centered on the antiquity of the text. The older, the better. Specifically, the rabbis, and they did this at, uh, at, uh, up on the Sea of Galilee, at Tiberias, they rejected any text that was believed to have been written after the time of Ezra and the prophet Malachi, roughly around the year 400 BCE. There's a reason for this. There was a widespread belief in Judaism that Malachi was the last prophet and that prophecy had ceased with him. This is why our Old Testament ends with the book of Malachi because of the Jewish belief that we inherited that after Malachi, nothing else was there. We have several witnesses to the belief that the prophecy ceased with Malachi. Here's one from 1 Maccabees, the book that we'll look at next week. So there, so there was a great distress in Israel. This is during the persecution. Such has not been seen uh, since the time the prophets had ceased to appear among them. This writer is looking back and remembers that the prophets had ceased to appear. Josephus, contemporary with Paul, says this. From Artaxerxes to our own time. Now, Artaxerxes is the Persian emperor during the time of Malachi and Ezra. So it dates it exactly. From Artaxerxes to our own time, he's writing at the time of Paul, the complete history has been written, the history of the Jews, but it has not been deemed worthy of equal credit with the earlier records, the ones in the Bible, because the spirit of prophecy had ceased. So there's this belief that after Malachi, God's spirit ceased to speak. And if God's spirit ceased, of course, nothing else could be scripture. As a result, any text after the time of Esther and Malachi could not be, for Jews, inspired or be scripture. Now, importantly for us, that includes the entire Greco-Roman period. So consequently, for any text to be considered scripture, it has to be written and available in Hebrew and believed to have been written in Hebrew, not translated not in the more recent languages of Greek and Aramaic. From the second century AD or CE on, any book that could not be documented as having been created in Hebrew could no longer be used as scripture by the Jews. That's a decision they make for themselves. Conversely, this means that any text, for any text to be considered scripture, it has to be written in Hebrew, not in Greek, not in Aramaic. But there's a flip side. This is a second century AD. Christians have been using these other books, the ones in Greek and Aramaic, for over 200 years. And even though the Jewish rabbis decide we're no longer going to use them, they're not scripture, this was not binding to Christians, and Christians continue to use these books as scripture. The difference is in the language. That's the primary difference between the 39 books that are in our Old Testament and the books that are in the Apocrypha. The 39 books in the Jewish Bible and in our Old Testament were all written in Hebrew and therefore were believed to be older. All the material that is now in the Apocrypha was written in Aramaic or Greek and therefore is believed to be more recent. Now, the decisions of the rabbis were less than perfect. You have a chart here. Some of the writings they accepted actually date later. There's, there's a universal agreement among scholars that the book of Daniel was written uh, almost three centuries after the deadline. Around the year 165, roughly. In other words, the book of Daniel is probably written during the Maccabean Revolt, at least the latter part of it. Well, that's way after, but Daniel was written in Hebrew 
therefore, and it, and it had the name of a person who was an earlier figure, Hebrew. So given that it had the name Daniel, given that it was in Hebrew, the book of Daniel makes it in, in spite of the fact that it's written later. Now, the Apocrypha consists of the books of the Greek Septuagint used by Jews and Christians, not included in the later Hebrew Bible, but books that continued to be used in the, in the Christian Bible, the Old Testament. The disconnect between what the Jews considered to be Scripture, the Hebrew Bible, and what Christians considered to be the Old Testament, the Greek Septuagint, would later become controversial, but not for another two centuries. We'll get to that in just a second. During the early fourth century, when Constantine had the first Christian Bibles printed in Greek, and the Old Testament, and three of them survive today, Sinaiticus, Vaticanus, Alexandrinus, these are all museums, we have them. They were all printed in Greek, and all three have the Septuagint in their Old Testament. So the first Christian Bibles printed in the fourth century, paid for by Constantine, all have the Septuagint in them. So they're scripture. All of the earliest Christian Bibles contain the Septuagint. By the late fourth century, though, very few people in the Western Empire, so two centuries earlier, the, the Romans, the empire was too big to govern. They divided it into East and to West. The East was Greek. Uh, and culture, Greek and language. The West was Latin and language and, and Roman and culture. So there were some real differences. <clears throat> By the late fourth century, most of the people in the Western Empire could not understand Greek. There was a need for a Latin version of the Bible. So just as people could not, you know, could not understand Hebrew, we needed it in Greek. Now, centuries later, we cannot understand Greek. So we need it in the Bible. That's why we need it in English today. The year 382, Pope Damascus I gave the church father, Jerome, who was by, at the time considered probably the greatest living um, ancient language scholar. He understood Hebrew, for example, which very few Christians did. He was given, Jerome was given the task of creating a fresh translation of the Bible into Latin. That is to translate from the Greek Bible into Latin. Specifically, Jerome was, was tasked with translating the Greek New Testament and the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint, into Latin. Latin was the language of the common people. Uh, the, the, the language of that day, it was the vulgar language. It's, it, it means crude in the sense of unsophisticated. For this reason, Jerome's Latin translation of the Bible would become known as the Vulgate, the common language Bible. Jerome's translation is completed in the year 405. It would prove to be revolutionary for several reasons. For one thing, it would become the Bible all Christians in the Western church would use for the next thousand years. That's huge. In the Roman Catholic church, the Latin Vulgate retained, was retained as the official Bible until 1979. And the Bible used today is kind of like a revised version of the Vulgate. The second reason that what he did was so revolutionary had to do with that what Jerome chose to translate from. Jerome was living in Palestine. He knew Hebrew. He knew the rabbis who were debating the books and were making decisions. Jerome was influenced by the decision of the rabbis to use the Hebrew text for their Bible, not the Greek Septuagint that the church had been using for 40 years. Jerome believed that Christians should follow their example. In other words, that as Christians, we should not use as Jewish scripture anything the Jews were not using as scripture. That was his argument. As a result, he believed that the Hebrew Bible should be the Christian Old Testament, not the Septuagint that the church had been using for 400 years. Jerome also incorrectly believed that the authors of the New Testament had used the Hebrew Bible as their scriptures. So this is one of his letters, letter number 50, he says this, we must rush back to the very source from which the gospel writers drew. The Hebrew words themselves must be presented. So he believes the New Testament was written in, in Hebrew. It was not. 
As a result, Jerome used the Hebrew Bible as the basis for his translation of the Old Testament for the Latin Vulgate. This meant that for the first time in its history, the church departed from the Septuagint. But Jerome's translation was momentous for a third reason, one that relates directly to our topic. Jerome not only used the Hebrew Bible as the basis for the text of the Old Testament, for the Latin Vulgate, he also wanted to use the Hebrew Bible as the basis for deciding which books were to be included. Jerome believed that only the 39 books in the Jewish Bible should be included in the Christian Old Testament, and that the additional books found in the Septuagint should not be in our Bible. He sought to exclude these additional books. Even though this meant removing books from the Bible that Christians had been using for 400 years. This is what Jerome says in his preface to Daniel. As I have said, these works, the, these other writings, are not found amongst the Hebrews. And therefore, this is his argument, they exhibit no authority as Holy Scripture. So for him, if it's not in Hebrew, it can't be Scripture. Jerome even coined a new word, apocrypha, for books that were not in the Hebrew Bible. Scholars say this book was never used. Jerome appears to have coined it, taking a, a, another form of the word and changing it to refer to this, in which he believed, in other words, he used the word apocrypha for books that are not in the Hebrew Bible and which he believes should not be scripture. Here's what he says in letter 107. Let us avoid all apocryphal writing. This is the first time this word has ever been used. Let us understand that they are not really written by those to whom they are ascribed. He thinks they're falsely ascribed. That many faulty elements have been introduced to them, new beliefs, and that it requires infinite discretion to look for the gold in the midst of the dirt. Now, with this, Jerome has introduced the idea that some of the books in the Christian Bible that Christians have been using for 400 years since the very beginning should be removed from the Old Testament. They should be distinguished as different, placed in their own category, given this new designation Apocrypha. Jerome also held that Christian belief and doctrine should not be based should only be based on the 39 books of the Hebrew Bible and not that. Now, the other 500-pound gorilla who's alive at this time is in North Africa, not far from Alexandria, a place called Hippo. His name, you've heard, is St. Augustine. He vehemently opposed what Jerome was doing. Augustine argued for the broadest inclusion of the books. Here's what Augustine says in the writing called Speculum. Those books should not be omitted, which are agreed to have been written before the advent of the Savior. Remember, the Jews cut it off 400 years before Jesus. Augustine's cutting it off with Jesus. So Augustine's including those 400 years. And now, as he says, because even though they are not accepted by the Jews, he knows this, yet the church of the same Savior has always accepted them. Augustine was arguing for continuity with the past, that the Christian Old Testament should continue to be what it had been for four centuries, the Septuagint. Here's what he says in City of God. We are right in believing that the translators of the Septuagint had been inspired by the spirit of prophecy that's what makes Scripture holy. It's inspired. And if so, with the Spirit's authority, the authors altered anything. In other words, it's not the same as the Hebrew, which is an argument that Jerome was using why it couldn't be Scripture because it's not the same as the Hebrew. If so, with the Spirit's authority, they altered the Hebrew to translate the Greek and use expressions in their translations different from those of the origin. We should not doubt that these expressions also were divinely inspired. 
he says exactly what the letter of Orestes says, that the translation itself, not just the original text, but the translation itself, the Greek translation, is divinely inspired. Augustine believed Jerome was departing from tradition and was radically altering the Christian Bible. Over time, what happened is that these two positions kind of got blended together with this result. Jerome's Latin Vulgate, with its Old Testament based on the Hebrew Bible, becomes the Bible of the church. So today, your Old Testament and your Bible is not based on the Septuagint. It is based on the Hebrew text. This changed the text that our Old Testament was based on from the Greek Septuagint to the Hebrew. But Augustine prevailed in his view that our Bible ought to include the books of the Septuagint. But a precedent had been set, one that called into question the validity of these books, both as scripture and as a source of Christian belief and doctrine. The, this, this distinction, along with Jerome's term apocrypha, though rejected by the church of Jerome's day, would return in the Reformation. Now, there is another reason for Protestants rejecting or objecting to the original, these extra writing Septuagint. Because these books were written in the Greek period, they contained new religious ideas. We, we were talking in the life after death class on Thursday about the fact that, that immortality of the soul and reincarnation are beliefs that, that were, were coming in during this period, as well as the belief in the resurrection. These later Greek beliefs would become the basis for the medieval view of salvation. And some of these beliefs would become problematic for the Protestant reformers, especially beliefs about the dead and life after death. Beliefs such as we can pray to the dead and we can pray for the dead, as well as the belief that the dead can help us and we can help them that the saints and the martyrs have accrued merit that can be made available to us in something called the treasure of merit. These beliefs will become the basic building blocks of the medieval church's belief for things such as purgatory and indulgences. And by the way, all of these beliefs are grounded in the, in the scriptures, in the Septuagint, in the traditional Jewish, uh, I mean, Christian Old Testament, but not in the original 39 books. With reformers like Luther and Calvin relying almost exclusively on the authority of Scripture and matters of faith, it matters what counts as Scripture. During the Reformation, the questioning of these beliefs led to a resurgence of the questioning of the books that had these beliefs. And Jerome becomes the ancient authority who was quoted to challenge the validity of these texts. Luther said that these books were not held equal to the sacred scriptures since they were not in the Jewish Bible. That's Jerome's argument too. Martin Luther cited Jerome as his source for distinguishing the books and for his also calling them apocrypha. In the 1500s, when Luther translates the scriptures into German, 1520, he includes the books of the Apocrypha, but Luther is the first to do something which is actually very creative. He separates the books out of the Old Testament, collects them together, and places them between the two, two New Testaments. Now, this makes perfect historic sense because you've got the Old Testament, the Apocrypha books are later, and the New Testament is later than that. So, but it does give rise to this idea that there's a period between the Testaments, an intertestamental period. The period between the close of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, and the opening of the New. Well, this period only exists if you remove the writings that were written in that period. Originally, there was no period between the Testaments because the writings continued all the way up to the time of Jesus. This becomes the basis of the idea that there's 400 years of silence between the Testaments. There's not. But if you take all the books out from the period, of course, there is. Martin Luther cites Jerome as his source for distinguishing these books. 
and for his belief that these books are not held to be equal scriptures since they're not in the Jewish Bible. He adds, though, that these books, the Apocrypha, are nevertheless useful and good to be read, which, by the way, was also Jerome's view. Later reformers are going to cite Jerome for their authority for removing the books from the Bible and denying them authority. 1647, the Westminster Confession of the Church of Scotland, the, the origin of the Presbyterian Church, is the first group to explicitly reject the Apocrypha as Scripture. This is from the Westminster Confession. This is their statement on this. The books commonly called Apocrypha, the Jerome's title, not being of divine inspiration, are no part of the canon of Scripture. So for the Westminster Confession, they're out. And therefore, are of no authority in the church of God, nor to be otherwise approved or made use of other than human writings. Now, down in England, England would continue to include the books of the Apocrypha. So when the King James Bible is printed, the Apocrypha is in it, but it's just scripture. But Jerome would again be cited as the reason why these books didn't have quite the same authority. So in the Articles of Religion of Church of England, which the Methodist Church inherits, we have this. The other books, first we have the 39 books of the Old Testament listed that we have, and it says, the other books, as Jerome saith. It's a dead giveaway. The church reads, for example, of life, for instructions of manners, but does not use them to establish any doctrine. The Puritans were opposed to any use of the Apocrypha. In the year 1699, they were the first to print a Bible in English without the books of the Apocrypha. With this, Jerome's views are finally prevailed, at least among Protestants. Today, there's a growing appreciation for the value of the Apocrypha, especially to help us understand the world of Jesus and the New Testament. That's why in modern translations of the Bible, You'll sometimes see this at the front where it says what it's using to base the translation on. The Septuagint is used as a great resource, along with the Hebrew text, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and modern translations. Your Bible today uses the Greek text of the Septuagint to establish the words of the biblical text along with the Hebrew. The other legacy of all this, of course, is that our Bibles today as Protestants, do not include the extra books of the Septuagint, nor do these books have any authority for establishing doctrine. So for the next nine weeks, we'll simply take a journey through this, and next week will be 1 Maccabees.